السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاۃ والسلام علی رسول الکریم اللهم صل علی سیدنا محمد وعلى علیہ وصحبہ اجمعین یا اللہ ان تعلیم کریم عظیم تحب العفو وعفو عنا یا کریم اللهم افتح لنا ابواب رحمتک یا کریم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين بسم الله this class is uh, very special for me for many reasons and i'm really thankful to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has brought us to this second round of reflecting on his book to a place where two ayas are uniquely challenging everyone at the time of the prophet islam and until now to produce something similar to what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent and uh, the specialness of today is uh, not only just in the beginning of this new topic although we haven't really finished the first one we can never finish anything however we are going to move forward but also because this is the first sunday after we received the copy of the second volume of iq and uh, this is 10 years of work and alhamdulillah i'm very thankful to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِّمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ أَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِّثْلِهِ وَادْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ A very plain rendering is that if وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِّمَّا If you are in doubt concerning that نزلنا على عبدنا we have sent down to our abd فأتوا بسورة then bring a surah من مثله like it and call upon your assistance ودو شهداءكم assistance is not a good translation call upon your shohada other than Allah if you are truthful Now, this ayah number 23 is uh, then connected with the next ayah that uh, says that you will not be able to do so. So, if we were to just try to understand this ayah superficially and quickly, uh, there is really nothing to, to reflect on. But Razi says there are 33 Masails in this one ayah. And uh, Baidavi has uh, several pages as well. And Imam Al-Tabri has several pages uh, on the various aspects of the, of the ayah. Mm -hmm. So there must be, there are 10 pages in Baidavi. So there must be something deep much more than what meets the eye through an apparent first reading. And that is our, inshallah, effort to deepen our understanding of the ayah. And although at one level, it just suffices for anyone to believe in the Quran, on the statement, on the belief, on the strength of the Iman. And uh, there is no... No issue with that either for those for whom that kind of faith is enough. But people who either have questions or who face questions from others about the Quran, they must be equipped with proper resources to answer 
the questions which arise either from themselves, from the children, from their relatives, from their friends, from whoever they arise from. But is your proof that this Quran that you believe in is really from, is not really a human composition. Let's put it this way. And uh, this is only secondary of, this is only of secondary importance for the, uh, for the belief is a light that's supra-rational, that just fills the heart, that whoever has tasted the Quran, whoever has really felt it in their beings, they don't need all of this. Uh, but we are living in a world that uh, really is very demanding for Muslims because the world is the world has been constructed when we were asleep and it has been constructed on the foundation that there is no creator that Big Bang happened and then everything else happened just give us the Big Bang and then we can have everything else it's a very coherent explanation once the Big Bang is there they can spin the tail and create everything including us humans and uh, come to the conclusion and I am really in sort of uh, not impressed by the falsehood of their but the force of their force of their narration um, I was uh, I was just listening to something yesterday in Urdu uh, it's a talk show on the internet where every single one of the participants, they were talking about Jamal, they were talking about beauty, and every single one of them was convinced that we all just evolved, and our sense of beauty also evolved, and the only person who was there who could who should have refuted their claim, didn't do so because of the overwhelming power of the narrative of the falsehood. So in many ways, this whole business all depends on this uh, evolution story that uh, Darwin started. And uh, now it has the force of a religion in the modern times. And we can reduce everything to that one force, even the sense of beauty. Remember we did a session on beauty last year when we're doing the themes. So the beauty is not innate, they say, it evolves. The sense of Jamal, sense of beauty evolves with the evolution of consciousness. And there is no connection between fitra, there is no connection between the beauty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants to every single creation he has created because he is beautiful and he loves beauty <clears throat> and everything he has done is beautiful from that aspect. So we are really, we are faced with such an overwhelming secular, uh, almost uh, against God uh, world in which we live the air we breathe, the ideas we hear about, everything is uh, just so deep now. And those of us who have gone through the university system or any kind of even schooling now, uh, it's so, it's like you don't even know <laughs> the poison is so deep, you don't even know that is there. Therefore, it is very important for us, it's very beneficial for us to equip ourselves with the Dalail, with the proofs, with the arguments, the like of uh, Razi and Baidavi and uh, Habri, like these are giants. Their minds are just enormously rich and uh, it's not that they were, uh, they were just blindly reading the Quran and saying, yes, 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 no. Just look at the nature of questions they are asking, even in just in this, this one ayah. This particular uh, ayah that we are dealing with, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ أَبْدِنَا This is the first time in the Quran, in our sequential reading of the Quran, that we are coming to this. Mm -hmm. This challenge, 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the disbelievers. And because this is a very specific topic of the sciences of the Quran and because it is relatively confined it is relatively uh, limited in terms of uh, and one can probably cover it in 300 pages of uh, of a book on, on on various aspects of this challenge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave. Um, so it would be, be, and because it is fundamental to the faith, it is fundamental to our understanding of who we are, it is fundamental to the nature of the Quran, therefore uh, this uh, will be beneficial to to look a bit deeper into it. So, are you ready? We are fortunate really, no, I don't want to use the word fortunate, but we are really blessed that uh, even if we don't have questions, we cannot come up with questions. Our scholars have have uh, done the thinking for us and they have produced the questions before they answer the answer what has to be answered. So just by way of uh, contest, the, by way of the context of the ayah, what happened before these ayahs is the establishment of the unique oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is absolutely one because remember we said when we did the ayahs on the creation, that he alone can create, no one else can create. So the ayahs before this, ayah number 23, are dealing with, with the creation, uh, uh, with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with the aspect of his tawheed, with the aspect of his oneness, with the aspect of the uniqueness of his, there is no one like him. And uh, one, of, one of the reasons, one of the Dalail, is that he is the creator. No one else can create. Having established that, then now what this ayah does is establishes the second aspect of our deen, and that is the prophethood of Prophet Islam. So when he finished with, not finished, but when he mentioned that he is the one who created Jala Lakumul Ard, the Firasham was Sama, Binam, Anzalam, the Sama Iman, Fakhraja Bihim in a Samarat, it is Kalakum. So all our existence depends on this earth and on what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala produces. Now he says, uh, he says, uh, uh, it is the Hujja ala Nabuvati Muhammad. It is the proof of the prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad. What is the proof of his prophethood? It is the Quran al Mu'ajjiz. It is the Quran that incapacitates. So Allah SWT sent proofs with the prophets. Always, he sent every single prophet who came, came with a proof, with a hujja, that would convince those who would, to whom he was sent, of his prophethood. When you think of uh, the proof uh, that Isa alayhi salam brought, Musa alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, like all of them came with incapacitating proofs and uh, it is really fascinating that uh, these proofs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent with the prophets address the prevalent beliefs the fundamental belief, beliefs of their time like at the time of uh, Fir'aun 
the magician's magic, uh, what they could uh, mesmerize, how they could mesmerize people and produce, that was the height of uh, power. And uh, likewise for, uh, for Isa alayhi salam, it's an extraordinary set of proofs that he gave him. He could cure and he could bring the light back to the blind and he could even create living the birds he would and remember the ayahs are always be iznilla be iznilla be iznilla every single proof that he brought salam, he always attributed it to the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he said I make these these clay birds and then they become living flying and this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says I am not doing it for myself so that is his proof uh, for the Prophet ﷺ, because he is sent as a Bashir and Nazir, the warner and the bringer of glad tidings for the entirety of humans and the jinn. The proof that Allah gave him is Al-Quran. And uh, this Quran is a proof in what sense though? How is the Quran a proof? Like, and what does a proof mean? Meaning something that incapacitates al muajjiz This Quran is al muajjiz bi fasahatihi allati bi zut fasahata min kulli mantik wa ifham. This Quran is, is uh, incapacitating through the fasaha, through the eloquence that it has, and through um, it's hard to translate what Badavi is saying here. Uh, it's the it's the purity of its style. It's the it's the it's something that is beyond the capacity of any human being to duplicate. Now, there's a very interesting aspect of this challenge, and uh, Razi brings that out by saying that, uh, see, this, this, uh, this challenge is given to those who consider themselves to be at the height of eloquence, the Arab poets and uh, people who were the first listeners of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they, um, they, their pride was their ability to produce poetry that they thought uh, no one else can do. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down a book that uh, challenged them to produce a surah like it. We'll come to inshallah what the surah means here. But uh, first, uh, first, let's try to understand the challenge itself. I mean, once again, we can just say, well, we believe no one else can produce. And history is a witness to that. It's been 1,400 and some 50 years, and no one has ever been able to produce anything like that. So that should be long enough time for the claim to be proven true but I think it would be helpful for us to really know 
what the what the real challenge is and how it proves the prophethood of the prophet Islam because we 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 are in a situation where people are just going to say so what's your proof of uh, him being a prophet you believe in him but we don't believe in him so give us a proof let's first uh, first understand the challenge and because this challenge is not just here it's also repeated or reiterated in uh, three other places so in order to understand we should actually make a note of uh, surah al qasas ayah number 49 fa tu bi kitabim min indillahi yu'akhdha minhuma bring a book from allah that's better than this and then in surah al isra uh, ayah 88 kul layni tama'at al insi in Insu wal jinnu ala an ya'tu bi misli haza al qur'ani la ya'tuna bi mislihi wa law kana ba'duhum li ba'din zahira so if the entirety of the human kind and the jinn were to get together and try to produce a quran like this they wouldn't be able to do so even if they were helping each other and then fa'tu bi ashri suwari mislihi in Surah Hud, Ayah number 13, bring 10 surahs like this. And here we have Fatubi Surah Mislihi, bring one surah like it. Um, so the first thing that uh, is, needs to be just as a footnote clarified is that the challenge is the same, but it is repeated in different specifications. Bring the entirety of a book like this, like the whole Quran, bring 10 surahs or bring one surah or bring a, bring a book like this. It's not that Allah SWT is changing his mind and he's, he's, uh, uh, he's decreasing or increasing the amount of challenge. It's the same challenge, but it is just being iterated in different ways to cover every possible uh, every possibility uh, because of his uh, wonderful mind Razi also tells us that uh, Allah SWT did not just uh, ask us to believe in his Tawheed not to gain the Ma'rifah the Gnosis, the understanding of Tawheed just because he says so not because of taklid. Um, likewise, he does not merely ask us to believe in the Risala just because I say so, believe. No, he gives us uh, he gives us reasons. And uh, then he says that uh, uh, and uh, I think now we are able to go into details of the challenge once this, these uh, preliminaries have been covered. In kuntum fi raibim mimma nazzalna ala abdina fatu bisura. Wa in kuntum fi raib. Raib is doubt. And uh, if you are in doubt, Mimma nazzalna. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says nazzalna. Mimma nazzalna. Of what we sent down. I think we covered this before but let me just repeat it. That uh, there is a very fine difference between inzal and Tanzil between sending something najman piece by piece and sending something all at once as the Torah came. Allah SWT gave the Torah to Musa al Islam all at once, and he gave uh, he gave the Quran to the Prophet Islam as Tanzil. 
what is the significance of these two in terms of uh, the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not send the Quran all at once in the form of one book. So this is this is a very deep uh, discussion in our tradition. Everyone who has uh, anything to do with the Quran has written about it. And uh, uh, there are many, many answers and many fine points uh, in, in this. Uh, serial gradual, gradual coming down of the Quran over the entirety of the life of the Prophet ﷺ from the day he received the first revelation. So there is a timeline of his life and there is a timeline of the life of those who accepted the message and those who rejected the message message. This needs to be fully understood. This We should never, never compromise on this, that that uh, Allah had a project assigned to his last messenger. This is something even Muslims, they shy away, away from it because it's, uh, it's not acceptable in our contemporary situation that uh, we have this position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his last messenger with a very specific goal. And he, alayhi salatu wa salam, told us that goal. Remember he said that um, my fight is uh, only until you say ashadu la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna muhammad rasulullah. And the second part is implied. And uh, if you do so, then you're fine. Your blood is in your life and your property. Everything is inviolable. But the timeline I am specifically referring to is these 23 years, which are a time out of history and time in history. It is in history, obviously, because we have dates, just like today is the 14th of April, subhanAllah. I mean, this is the Shawal. Allah Akbar. Remember the something very extraordinary that anyone who has read, read the Seerah, the Prophet may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take us to Arafah. When he is standing there and the largest gathering of his companions is with him, he comes up with something that really always strikes me. I, and anyone who, who reflects on that khutbah, he says, what day is this? Like, what day is it? <laughs> what place is it? Which city is this? Have you, have you ever thought about that? Like, this is the khutbah of Hajj, and he's asking about the date and the day and the time and the place. Why? Why is that? See, he, he alayhi salatu was salam, was deeply aware and conscious of his duty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assigned to him and it weighed so heavily upon him that it broke his back. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala released the weight that he carried. What was the duty assigned to him? To clean the Arabian Peninsula from the filth of idol worship and everything that goes with it. They killed their daughters. They fought blood, blood wars, revenging each other's blood. They, you know, that was a society which was just immersed in the darkness of disbelief and no prophet had come there for centuries. And the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was there, is there, will remain there. And they went around the house naked. They did all those things. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his last messenger. He said, go and clean it up. 
like clean it up physically. And he did that, alayhi salatu wasalam. Remember the day he entered the Kaaba? What did he do? The first thing he did was to break all the idols they had collected there, like throw them out. So this physical cleansing that needed to happen also required political power. It required him to be the supreme arbiter of everything, the affairs of that whole peninsula. Every single thing had to be restructured, reoriented, reformed, recreated on the model of Tawheed and Risala and Mahad. Now, this particular aspect of the Qur'an requires inherently to be sent down Najman, piece by piece, addressing the situation as it arose. And anyone who reads the Sirah or who, who internalizes the Sirah would uh, really, you, when you get to the ninth year, it just seems that the gear has changed now. The speed with which events start to happen in the ninth year of Hijra, like there is a rush. There is a rush unlike previous years because Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the time granted, he has granted to his last messenger is now coming to a close. And nobody knows. So in the... In the Hajj Karma, so this is already the end of ninth year when um, this uh, surah comes. The only surah in the Quran that came without the two names of mercy, Surah Al-Bara, Surah al -Tawbah. Um Sayyidina Ali said that there is no Bismillah Rahman Rahim in the surah because it came with the sword came with the sword. So this, this feeling that the time is up now and there is uh, the, the ayah in the in this surah which says that uh, you've got four months now, those who disbelieve just roam around for four more months at the most and uh, after that There is no choice after that for these people. They had to either leave the Arabian Peninsula or become a Muslim or be killed. So when they say, well, Islam spread with the sword and this is our proof, you say you got four months. <laughs> yes. There was a project. There was a project to clean the Arabian Peninsula from the filth of idol worshipping and everything that came with it. And this justified every single means, including the sword. And that means this whole idea that we now so, every, many Muslims rush, oh yes, we believe in democracy, we believe in freedom, we believe in freedom of religion, we believe in our, no, we don't. We don't believe that the haq and the batil are the same. We don't believe that Islam is just like any other religion. No. Because there is the choice outside that time period and place. Like Muslims didn't go, the Prophet ﷺ didn't send people out there to kill everyone on this earth who doesn't believe. But within the Arabian Peninsula, within the sacred inviolable place, within the house, like in, in, the, in the area where he was sent, there was no choice for anyone else to do anything else but to believe, be killed, or leave the place. After like 20 years, 21 years, So, I mean, there are the other examples. No, alayhi salam. 950 years, can you imagine how many generations of that? Calm. And what happened after that? He just came to the conclusion and he made this dua that 
they are not going to believe and not only that, they are not going to give birth to anyone but their like. So take care of them now. And Allah took care of them. So we, yani, I have to be clear about these things. We cannot just... Uh, there is a very specific time in human history when the last of his messengers is walking and talking and breathing and eating and interacting with people. This time is unlike any other time in human history. And the proof of our statement that this time is unlike any other time in human history is that human history has never been the same since then. It has never been the same. This clear distinction between Haq and Batil manifesting in the serial time, in history, in, in, in the verifiable, empirically known data, like that's an obvious proof. But our proof is also of the inability of millions and billions, actually, billions of people to ever come up with a book, with a surah like it. So, um, so we understand the challenge that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has. Um, uh, in this, in this surah, uh, we are going to, inshallah, uh, take our time to deepen our understanding. But I wanted the question to be to be uh, fully understood before we get to the answer, because a lot of time, even questions are not clear. So the challenge here is to bring uh, a surah like it. And as we just noticed that uh, in other ayahs, we have a challenge to bring 10 surahs like it or bring the Quran like this. But the essence of the challenge is the same, meaning to produce something similar to it. Now, the challenge is given to obviously the first recipients, the immediate environs, the people who claimed to be at the height of eloquence. And uh, um, what, what is the nature of this challenge? Well, first of all, it is, number one, in their language. So the challenge is uh, valid because the Quran uses words, vocabulary, a language that is their language. It's not something written in a totally unknown language to them. So the they they really um, they really believed that everyone is uh, ajami, like a lower class human being, whoever cannot be eloquent in Arabic as they are, they are somehow lesser human beings, and uh, this is the. This is the you know, height of uh, human, <laughs> people will say, <laughs> their evolution. This is totally wrong. This is the height of human achievement to be an eloquent speaker, orator, poet. So, Allah SWT sent the book and then challenge them on that one particular aspect which they thought was their specific characteristic, their specific trait. Like I just gave the example of uh, the time of Fir'aun, 
the their thing was the magic right so lasmanatala sent his two messengers to firaun and what did he do oh he said you are just a magician like other magicians and i'm going to prove you wrong by having my magicians compete with you and defeat you it's really something i hope it's very clear is there is nothing really uh, difficult in it that each age has its own characteristic scale of measuring things one particular aspect of a, of, a, of of a time of a place of a civilization uh, that stands out what is the what is our time what distinguishes the time in which we are living <laughs> it's a Inshallah, booking a book, reading Quran in the age of science. You remember COVID? And uh, there is a scene in the Quran, the one I just mentioned about Musa -Islam and Harun -Islam going to Fir'aun and telling him, um, they just went to him and asked him to, to let when Israel go with them, like they were not even, at that time, they were not even asking him to correct himself. Enough had been done and they just went to say, okay, you do what you want to do, but let these people go. You have enslaved them and you have uh, made them into second class citizens. And these people are doing what they are doing now. SubhanAllah, they even forgot what they were they're doing exactly what was done to them by Fir'aun. They have become the Fir'auns. But what does he do? What does Fir'aun do? He say, oh, you remember? You were just in the basket. I picked you up. I raised you up in my palace. And remember then what you did? You killed someone? Like he, instead of dealing with the situation, what does he do? He just tells Musa salam, what he did in the past and how and he, he was just a helpless little baby. And the response of Musa is just amazing. He said, yes. He doesn't deny anything. He said, yes. But I just came here to, I did what I did, but I am asking you to get, to let these people, these slaves that you made, human beings you made slaves, just let them go. He says, then he, just the scene of the, I just want to get back to the, the scene of the court is that these magicians are standing behind Fir'aun. So they are the authority, they are the authority for Fir'aun. And he says, well, look at this. He tells his people in the court, oh, he's a magician. And he says, just gather. What do you say? And the people say, well, just gather your magicians and have a competition. So just imagine this court of the Fir'aun and all his uh, courtiers are sitting in front of him and these magicians come and they are the, the he, his authority is on the basis of their magic because people believe in magic. Now the COVID came and this man in the South is the, is the one who started it. He would have Dr. Fauci stand behind him like the magicians of the Fir'aun. And uh, every time I saw that, it just reminded me of that court of the Fir'aun. And he would, he would, he would uh, make his... Uh, statements, whatever the statements he would make, and then he will turn around and look at Dr. Fauci. And he would ask him to nod. He would ask him to, and he, he became so tired of nodding. Eventually he, he rebelled against uh, this joker. But what was it? It was the 
embodiment of science. For, for people, Dr. Fauci was the authority on whatever the, this Trump was saying was true because the scientists behind me, and he wasn't even a scientist, he's a public health officer. He has nothing to do with science. But nevertheless, everything was, uh, was forced down the throats of everyone on the authority of science. So we are living in the, in the age of science. So the God they have constructed is the God of science with a small g. How do we, how do we negate that? And the Muslims who worship this God, like they are just so terrible. One gets sick, literally sick, of uh, what they find in the Quran. Subhanallah. What is the what is the challenge here? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is not saying this is the book of science that I have sent down. It tells you the sun and the moon revolves. It tells you the. Rain comes down from the sky. You know, Allah is not saying what is the challenge here of the Quran. Produce something like this. What is the challenge? The challenge is described in our tradition on the basis of uh, the style, the eloquence, the the incapacitating Quranic force. And uh, the totality of that text being filled evenly throughout with the same kind of eloquence. It's not that something is higher and something is lower. It's not that one part of the Quran is better than the other, like they have the, the poets, right? They knew Radhi, <laughs> subhanAllah. He gives the example, he says, look at them. Uh, the, the uniformity of the challenge of the eloquence of the Quran, they couldn't really they couldn't really uh, produce anyone of their great poets who could, they couldn't point out or say, oh, look at Umar al Qais, look at Nabiga, uh, look at Zuhair. They couldn't really come up with these because they knew themselves that when it comes to the fasaha, when it comes to the eloquence, when it comes to the beauty, when it comes to the construction of his poetry, or anybody's poetry, um, they knew that um, Imran Kais is very good in uh, describing the horses and the women, and uh, uh, fear is uh, prominent in Nabuga's poetry, and uh, uh, the wine is... Uh, Asha's and Zohir is uh, hope and all of those poets they have they have their own uh, characteristics they have their own specific little islands uh, in which they excelled but this book came and it's just unlike anything else when it comes to give them uh, give them enticement for Jannah, it says, فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ عَيُونَ No soul has even, uh, even the slightest idea of the coolness of the eyes that Allah SWT has prepared. And he says that وَفِيهَا مَا تَحِيلْ أَنفُسُ وَتَلَزُّ الْعَيُونَ and he says that uh, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, wants to warn them, he says, Afa amin, afa an bil bar. Are you not worried that he would uh, sink the earth with you, like the part of the earth? 
آمین تو منف سما یا یکسیفہ بھی کمل ارد فائزا ہی یا تمور اما من تم من فی السماء یعنی رسول علیکم حاسبہ How can they, are you not worried that the one the one whose dominion is the heavens and the earth he will sink the earth with you or he would send the rain of stones upon you یعنی اس جسٹ اللہ یعلم ما تخمل کل انس و ما تغید الارحام و ما تزداد اللہ is the one who knows what is in the in the womb یعنی the nature of the challenge needs to be understood the challenge is to those who prided themselves to be the most eloquent people on earth. And the challenge is to produce something about which they claim to be the best. So, we have to move, but I mean, there are many aspects of the challenge. But I wanted to, I mentioned this many times before, a few times before, but here it comes now for the first time, ala abdina. Ala abdina. This uh, title that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the messenger he sent, alayhi salatu wa salam, it is not something that he is claiming. It is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala attached to him. So we can claim to be the slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can make whatever claims we want to make. But when he himself, Azza wa Jal, gives that title to someone, that is very special. So Baidawi, he says, إِلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ وَعَدَافَ الْعَبْدَ إِلَىٰ نَفْسِهِ تَعَالَىٰ تَنْوِيهَا تَنْوِيهًا بِذِكْرِهِ وَتَنْوِيهًا عَلَىٰ أَنَّهُ مُخْتَصٌ بِهِ مُنْقَادٌ لِحُكْمِهِ تَعَالَىٰ He annexed, he attached the title, the characteristic of his al-abd ala abdina see this is the abdina meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using the first person plural noun for himself and he is attaching the last of his messengers to that exalted station and this is to tanmihan bizikrihi this is to celebrate and and to to let everyone know that annahu muhtassun bihi he exclusively belongs to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was exclusively munqadun li hukmihi he was there exclusively under his command, under his hukm. And this special station that Allah SWT granted to the Prophet is really very, very significant for us too. And we don't make distinction between, we don't say one prophet is better than another prophet. Remember in Surah, the last ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah, we, we don't, we believe in all of them. But there are grades in everything. Everything has grades. So this one, one man, one vote is a totally false system of governance and it's not even working 
It's not even working in the place where it was constructed, let alone other places on earth. You know, we have, we are facing a choice between a genocide supporter and a totally madman. This is the end product of uh, this democracy next door. Everywhere else is the same situation. So the system is totally flawed because the foundation is wrong. How can, like, even on the, on the scale of uh, basic rationality, it is just impossible to defend that the people of knowledge and the people without knowledge are the same. You just go to this booth and you put in a piece of paper, and that doesn't decide anything because decisions are already made. So... Um, so we don't, we don't, I mean, we don't, dis, we don't make that kind of uh, differentiation between uh, the prophets of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But the the grades are there, and Allah knows their grades. They have their own stations. They made a mithak, a second mithak, a second covenant with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala took. The second covenant from all the children of Adam he was going to send as prophets. And the Prophet Islam has told us himself what happened and uh, what his station is. That's a topic for another time, but just wanted to um, make a footnote of. Uh... So, what is the surah? The next word. وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ أَبْدِنَا فَأْتُ بِسُورَةٍ فَأْتُ بِسُورَةٍ What is a surah? So there are 114 surahs in the Quran. We all know that. So surah is a unit and uh, the minimum number of ayahs in a surah are three. So it's a unit of the Quran that has the following three characteristics. Number one, it has a name. Number two, it has a minimum of three ayahs. And the third is not really a condition for something to be a surah because we know Surah Tawbah does not have the Bismillah. But when the Quran was being revealed, this was one of the ways in which the Prophet was told that a new surah is starting when Jibreel Islam came with Bismillah. So it's not part of the definition because Surah Tawbah does not have the Bismillah, but it's a surah. And uh, a surah is, uh, so I hope it's clear, a surah is a portion of the Qur'an, it's, it's a unit of the Qur'an, and it has to have three ayahs as a minimum. And we know the maximum ayahs as well, surah, but that's not part of, the, part of the definition. Definitions are very important. We have to be very clear about definitions. And... Uh, uh, and there are some issues related to uh, issues in the sense of uh, Masail related to the Surah. I think we should devote some time next week on that, but just linguistically. Uh, If you look at the word surah, what do we have? Seen, wow, ra. Right? So it's sur, and the tamar buta at the end makes it feminine. And uh, seen, wow, and ra. Because wow in the middle is either 
the original root letter or it is there because it has been changed from the Hamza. So this gives us two possibilities for the word Surah. One is seen Vaura, and in that sense, uh, it is a wall. The wall around the city, for example, because it encompasses the city or a part of the city. And a surah of the Quran is called a surah because it is part of the Quran, meaning it encompasses the Quran or a part of the Quran. So that's why it's called a surah. Uh, the the city wall they used to have walls around the city they have just stopped doing it now <laughs> when the when the walls were there there were gates also so you could close the gates and there were people who would stand guard so robberies wouldn't happen at night because everyone is contained inside the inside the city walls and everyone knew there is no escape if you rob somebody if you do some other thing like where would you go because the, the walls are all there with the gates so they took the gates away they made everything open but the walls contain cities and cities have different aspects of life in them so there is this uh, bazaar of the goldsmith and there is a spice bazaar and there are all those specific places in the city and because the surahs of the Quran also contain all kinds of uh, knowledge and ahkam and the laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent and the qasas he has sent and the stories that he has mentioned in the Quran and the, uh, and the warnings that he has given. So all of these are contained within the surahs. And... Uh, so this is uh, a surah, and the surah is also uh, a surah is also a milestone, and uh, like Al Razi, he says that uh, if you ask, so why did Allah Subhanahu wa divide the Quran into surahs, and the answer is that there are many benefits of doing so. And uh, one of the benefits is that uh, if you are really reciting the Quran, when you come to the end of a surah, you feel so happy that you have finished something. If you're traveling for a, such long time and you got a stopping place on the way, that means the Kari feels a sense of elation, of happiness, of joy that uh, he has reached this, this place. So, and the one who is memorizing it, it's very easy for them to memorize. And one who is reciting in the, in the Salah, it just gives you boundaries, like you can recite as many surahs as you want. But it just, there are many benefits, he says. And uh, uh, surahs are also... Uh, surahs also have sifas and uh, characteristics and special taste like they produce especially the shorter surahs إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا وَأَخْرَجَتِ الْأَرْضُ وَأَسْقَالَهَا وَمَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا like when you read this surah you just start shaking because of the intensity of uh, of the scenery that comes with it. And uh, they produce specific tastes, and using the taste not in the physical sense, but the taste in the spirit, in the heart. And uh, it was a question which uh, uh, was there, and I just came across this again in uh, Razi. 
Um, it says that uh, the question was about the surahs. So, and this comes also from the the work of the Oriental Orientalists as well. That uh, they say, okay, if you say the Quran was uh, well, the extremists, uh, <laughs> the extremists among them, they don't even say, they don't even believe that the Quran was uh, during the time of the Prophet, wasalam, they say it was put together in the second century. But even those who don't go to that extreme, they say that it was put together in the form of a book during the time of the third Khalifa, Sayyidina Osman. And because it came together in the form of a book so late after the demise of the Prophet from this dunya, uh, it is the companions who put together the, the order of the surahs. And uh, some of them even tried to reorder the surahs and to produce something according to the history of Revelation, which is a very interesting undertaking because on the one hand, if they are saying that it was put together by the companions, Quran as we have it today, was put together by the companions and they gave it the present sequence it starts with Surah Fatiha and it ends with Surah Nas, but it is not something that was given, that was uh, um, ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not something that the Prophet ﷺ himself did. And uh, so it's the, the order of the surahs, they say, is... Uh, from the time of the companions. But then they, when they produced this Quran according to their order of surahs, what did they rely on? They relied on the evidence from the seerah in terms of uh, the order in which the... So the surah talks about the change of Qibla, for example, that they know that the Qibla changed when Muslims arrived in Medina, so this surah must be from the Medinan time. So they are still looking at the sequence that we already know from our own sources of the, of the surahs. So, Ya Ayyur Mudassir, uh, they say when the Prophet ﷺ came back from after the first revelation, he was he asked uh, Sayyidah Khatija to cover him up, cover him up. Ya yeah, Muzammil, Ya yeah, Mudassir, these surahs came after that. So they are still relying on, on the sequence, for the sequence, but they are denying that the, um, that the order in which we have the Quran today was also revealed to the Prophet wasalam. And uh, it's not just the Orientalists, uh, there is also within our own tradition, there is this view uh, that uh, the order of the surahs, the sequence in which we have them in the Quran today, is something that the companions did. But this is a minority opinion. The majority opinion is that the surahs came in in a form of uh, sequential revelation over a period of time from the day the first ayah came, first five ayahs came of Surah Al-Alaq to the last ayah, which we have three candidates for that, two or three candidates for that, for the last, very last ayah. And they also divide in terms of the ayatul ahkam, like this is the last ayah dealing with the legal issues and this is the last ayah otherwise. So uh, anyway, we, we have those. And then because the Quran was being revealed in such a manner that is an ayah would come and Jibreel will tell the Prophet to put this ayah 
in such and such surah at such and such place. So the classic example is uh, of Kalala, the ayah of Kalala in, that uh, tells us what to do with the inheritance of a man who dies without having any children. Uh, that ayah uh, is a very late ayah because they ask, they ask you about the Kalala. This is how they, the ayah starts, they ask you. So when they, there are these ayahs, Yasalunaka, they ask you, uh, these these questions arose in terms of uh, legal aspects of something that they, the companions, were not clear about. So they would ask the question, uh, what to do? With it. And then Allah SWT revealed the legal hukm, the legal, the, the law about that particular situation. And there is also this clarity that it's not that Allah SWT is uh, sitting and waiting for someone to ask a question and then he would send down the law. No, the law was already there to come, but this is how he had uh, configured it. That Because, you know, this is a very real human situation. We, you know, this is a very human situation. This is the beauty of our book that it was revealed in the full light of history with spotlight. Like we have these individual human beings, like men and women in flesh and bones, like real human beings. And they are being told uh, something and then obviously they have a question. And when they have a question, what do they do? They go and ask the Prophet ﷺ and he explains to them. And sometimes when it is a question of law, he doesn't make the law. Law is given by Allah SWT, so then... He receives the revelation. So, um, so surah is uh, from seen wawra or seen hamza ra. And because of that, uh, that uh, possibility of the wow being a hamza, uh, there are slightly, slightly different. Uh, <laughs> connotations of the word. So when it is uh, when it is uh, it is seen wow ra then it is the it is the wall of the city and the wall of the city contains uh, contains uh, what is behind the wall and the surahs of the Quran contains the Quran therefore uh, it uh, uh, it is called a surah because uh, it encompasses the entirety of the Quran and uh, the second, when it is uh, it is Hamza, it is the rank, a station, a level. So it is called a surah because it is a rank, it is a manzil, it is a it is a station, and uh, like the levels of length and uh, sh and shortness, the merit and the honor. Um, so because the surahs are recited and there is a reward for recitation, so it's called a surah. From Seen Hamza Ra, which uh, it's very interesting that uh, our scholars, when they want to explain a Quranic word, they bring the Dalil, they bring the proof from the poetry of the Jahiliya. And uh, sometimes it becomes puzzling for people who don't understand what's happening. Because obviously Jahliya is the dark time, it's not the time we want to imitate. 
but yes yes but the the beauty here is that huh, the poetry of the jahiliya had used the vocabulary that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used uh, in various senses and the sense of the surah in this particular case the example we are giving uh, is illustrated by a couplet from nabiga for example by david does that wali rahti harabin maqaddin sura fil majdi laysa urabu ha bi mutar he says that uh, and the band of harab and qad possess a rank these are the tribes so the, the what he is trying to say is that they have a rank so the second meaning of the surah if it is hamza seen hamza ra is from the from the from that meaning of rank so the question then uh, which i haven't answered and i think we should answer that next time because we are already over time is about the surahs of the quran and the names of the surahs of the quran and uh, the their uh, i have already mentioned that their uh, sequence as opposed to the views the minority view in our tradition and the view of the orientalists that this was put together by the companions can you imagine that companions decided that uh, surah an-nisa is going to be number 4 what was like how would they do that especially because the last ramadan of his blessed life on this earth jibril al islam came twice to him to recite the quran to and to listen him recite again but because he left this this world without the book being put between the two covers the book was there the book was zalik al kitab la rayb fi the kitab is used so early so the book was there but it wasn't bound together and once when when the leaves papers are not bound together you can shift them around you can move them around you can change their sequence but once they are bound they become fixed so we will inshallah go into that and we'll also look at the names of the surahs and then we'll go on to uh, a very in, a very uh, important discussion about uh, about mimma if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to gather together again next sunday inshallah and reflect on his book and uh, um may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it wa in kuntum fi raibin mimma nazzalna ala abdina mimma and then there is a um, reflection on mim mislihi fa tu bi suratim mim mislihi what does that mean so this uh, Are there any questions? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Uh, Doctor, I'm going to go back to Surah Toba and the instructions uh, given in it in the beginning. Um, are those instruction time and place specific, or are they in general? Yeah. Mashallah. Yeah. This is um, this is actually very. um very important question because uh, the dual time frame of the revelation of the dual time frame frame in which the quran operates needs to be extremely clearly understood the quran operates at two different kinds of time frames one is the serial 
specific date starting in Ramadan when he was 40 year old, alayhi salatu was salam, ending just a few days before his departure from this earth. So this is a time-bound operational reality of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dealing with specific human situation in a given geographical location. Very well known, everything is clearly uh, outlined, geographical parameters are defined, and so are the temporal parameters. The second level at which the Quran appears is vertical time, meaning that it has no, it is not bound by the time or place where it was revealed. Now, there are ayahs in the Quran which are uh, specific to the time and place when it was being revealed. And uh, there are ayahs in the Quran which are, uh, most of it is not time bound and place bound. But there are ayahs um, which are uh, which are uh, specific, specific to the events which were happening. So the answer to your question is this, that there are two aspects of the Quran and this particular surah which came without the two names of mercy um, uh, is that, well, all, all of the Quran is directly addressing everything that is happening, but there are ayahs which are specifically addressing and they their application is uh, for that time, for that place, for that event. I hope that answers the question. Fasihu fil ardi arba'ata ashurim wa'alamu annakum ghayru mujzillahi wa anna allaha muhzil kafiri. So fasihu fil ard. This is very interesting uh, in terms of the usage of earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in the second ayah of Surah Al-Tawbah that uh, go walk around earth for four months. Um, and after that, something else is going to happen. So this particular ayah is then uh, addressing a specific place, a specific time, a specific people, so this and this is an announcement from Allah and his Rasul to people. It's not saying to the Quraysh, it's not saying to the people who are going to go for Hajj. It's, it's, it's general, but its address is specific to the people who are being addressed. And they knew, and everyone knew uh, what is, uh, and the reasoning is given in the fourth ayah, except for those with whom you have made a treaty. And then, uh, yani, so this, this particular ayah, uh, particular passage actually addresses um, a specific place and a specific time. Is that clear? Alhamdulillah, thank you. <laughs> Accept it from us. I know sometimes it's very, it may be difficult for everyone to, to grasp what is being said, but uh, because you still come every Sunday, I hope there is something of benefit in what we do. And uh, this is a journey, like we are not, we are not with the Quran for a week or two weeks. The Quran is with us, inshallah, until we go and when we go, it's with us in our grave as well. So try to 
like there is no reason to be impatient if something is not clear it will become clear over time what we are trying to do is build a foundation for understanding the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather than just just uh, individual ayahs and foundations are very difficult to build because first there is no space because the space is already filled with another foundation so and we cannot we don't have the possibility of i mean people there are people in this dunya on this earth who can take the your foundation away in a second and just clean you out inside out that's a great blessing if you go through that experience but just imagine if you don't have any foundation left you'll be mad immediately like everything will just disappear and uh, it's a very deep spiritual experience and it's not possible for everyone to sustain it like it just breaks you but uh, it's a blessing too in the sense that uh, you are cleaned out totally and allah gives that possibility to the one who goes for hajj and allah gives that possibility to the one who embraces islam after having not been a muslim these are the two and the third obviously the child who is going to be born today but we are not there and not everyone who goes for hajj receives that so we need to be very diligent and uh, make our efforts thoughtfully and sincere with sincerity and with this uh, willingness to remove the bricks i find that to be the hardest thing to do for people to because these bricks have been with them unconsciously or consciously throughout their their life and uh, people are not willing to take those bricks out so they remain what they are day after day and uh, the self examination is not there so we need to be brave and patient and uh, willing in the reconstruction of our inner beings on the basis of what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us and what his messenger has taught us the whole problem i i feel we have as muslims is that we have just inherited three or three and a half centuries of poison and we give it to our children generation after generation we are just filled with it because the construction that happened in these centuries is not what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us so the leadership is corrupt because the air is corrupt and uh, may allah protect us may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us may he give the light of his book may he enhance the light of his book every single minute of our life and every single day of our life so that darkness we have goes away Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahimin assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh